Welcome to my talk called Simple Modern Java Microservices in the Cloud. Uh, obviously, we're at J Barcelona, and I'm very happy to be here. If somebody's already slightly sleepy, maybe you have enjoyed yourself yesterday too much, or you just want a nap. Uh, the TLDR of the session is having a lot of services is difficult. Try to limit the number of moving things so that you can somehow deal with the complexity so that when somebody asks you how is life, you don't say I hate computers immediately. But in all fairness, uh, my name is Andrzej Grzesik. Uh, because it's quite complex to say properly and spell and so on, I go by Axe. So if you call me Axe, I, I will react. And this is how I usually go. I also have a Twitter, an email, a blog, and so on and so on. The blog is completely dead, so tweet at me or email. If you want the slides, email. Facts about me, uh, I'm proud to be a Java champion, uh, have been to Java 1 uh, when it still happened, and I was a Java 1 rockstar, and so on, and so on, run a conference, but we're not here to talk about me. If you have any questions about the talk, there are microphones. If you're shy, you can also raise your hands. If you dislike that, you can also type the question into the app, and I will try to look at it, and if the internet is gracious to me, I will actually read it and try to answer. If you have any questions about Revolut, uh, Talk to me after, uh, talk to the people at the booth. We have a booth, uh, obviously. And uh, naturally, Revolut is hiring us, and that's not really a surprise. So if you're an engineer, uh, you would like to see what it's like to work in a company that just uh, announced that we've crossed our 20 million uh, customers mark and keep growing, uh, and see what it's like firsthand, it's a good time to join. Uh, if you want to win a Nintendo Switch, use your phones. I know, this is the slide that, that gets most of the pictures, I know. So it's best we get it out of the way. Three, two, one, let's continue. Uh, obvious disclaimer, my opinions are my own. I am not saying whatever my uh, salary uh, payer is uh, thinking. I'm representing my own opinions and so on and so on. And I also love dry jokes. So if you see a dry, jokes, uh, dry joke, feel free to laugh. Uh, I might, I might not, but I will try to drink because this is also very important when you're doing a talk. So, uh, sadly, it's not beer. Uh, modern Java microservices in the cloud. If somebody says bingo, uh, I will say, yeah, you win. Uh, the question that we should ask ourselves uh, is what is it that makes a service modern? Uh, it's what, July year is 2022. Uh, is it the language? Does it going to guarantee that we're going to make a modern Java service? Is it uh, the technology? Is it just running in the cloud? Is it uh, maybe the framework or the version of the framework that we use? Or maybe is it the architecture? Uh, we'll talk about all of those aspects in a while. But to get yourself into, into the correct mood for the talk, I am going to ask you, imagine what it would be like to do software without the bloat. So if the software was not restricting you in any way, if you could do the best code there is, and there is plenty of spaces, so if you want to come over, uh, there are seats in the front, don't, don't be shy, there are plenty of seats still. Everybody has space. So software without the bloat. You want to make a change, you do the change. The things don't restrict you. The opposite situation, when software really, really restricts you, when it's hard to get anything done, you probably have experienced. If you haven't, uh, I do envy you. Keep it that way. But most of us have, have experienced that. Some people call it legacy. Some people call it, uh, well, something else. Uh, uh, that brings us to the aspect of code quality. Obviously, it matters, especially in the long run. It matters a lot. So what is bloat? If you like memes and movies, this should be moving. And I promise dry joke, so I drink. The language. Is the language going to make a difference? Well, somebody could say, let's just use Scala, Groovy, Java, 11, 17, 18, 19. Uh, soon it's going to be 20. Maybe Clojure, maybe Salon, maybe something else. And it's going to make your software bloat free. Uh, maybe Rust, maybe Go, maybe something else. Uh, I'm not going to say whether you're correct. I'm only going to say that the litmus test that I like to approach is this one. It's 2 a.m. You're just coming home from an evening out, and it was very enjoyable. It was very pleasant. You're just tired, nothing else. 
And there is the support call, and you are answering that, and you have to reason about the code that you have in front of you because something there isn't really working. What can you do? Well, if your software is really, really cleverly written, has a lot of squiggly lines, reasoning about it is super difficult. I personally don't like such situations. I like things that are quite straightforward and almost in my face, because when I have to fix things, the reasoning about what's happening under, under the hood is trivial, and that means fixing anything and sometimes something break is very easy. So that leaves uh, my personal choice, uh, being Java and Scala, as in I mix the languages. And that also means that uh, in Revolut, because this talk is about how we do stuff at Revolut as well, uh, we default to Java. So we have a couple hundred microservices, not 1,500, more like two or 300. Uh, we default to Java, so every single service is most likely written in Java. The question was, is choosing a particular language uh, going to save you from the bloat? Well, you can already guess the answer, not really. So maybe the framework. Maybe the framework is the answer, maybe the something is, is the holy grail. Well, if we check the weather forecast, for example, 22nd of June, which was a very good day to check the forecast uh, for frameworks, uh, it's going to say that framework X is going to be the best. You can also see that, ask somebody else and they are going to tell you com something completely different. You get the gist, it is not the framework alone. Is it the database? Well, let's have a look. Should we use SQL? Should we go no SQL? Should we go back to SQL? If you've worked with Hadoop early on, uh, you remember this uh, beautiful elephant. It was fun. It was a bit gory at, at the very beginning, but it still allowed a lot of things to happen. Now there is a lot of people uh, who default to Postgres because it's a very good, powerful database. But the bottom line, again, becomes the database doesn't guarantee your software to be amazing or hard to work with because you can have problems with Postgres, you can have problems with any other database, and you can have awesome software built on a relational database like po Postgres. And I like, like Postgres a lot, and we use it at Revolut, and we are very happy about it. As in Postgres solves 99 percent of our storage requirements. It's a default database that we use, and it works. Now, architecture, should we use lab Lambda? Should we use something else? Mm, you get the gist. Is it the test that's going to guarantee we do not run ourselves into the bloat? Well, there is only one aspect about tests that uh, everybody keeps repeating. The, it is everybody wants to have written more tests. Uh, we keep writing tests as well. We have tens of thousands of them. They help a lot, and they do help a lot, but still you can, you can get there. And then I know there is always this very energetic person, a very opinionated person in the room that feels maybe if we use, for example, this magic combination of tools, let's use Kotlin, let's use Kafka, let's use Kubernetes, and then everything is going to be fine. Uh, and that's okay, that's an opinion. And to that person, there is usually a person who is going to call it the 3K apocalypse. And to get it completely straight, I have nothing against Kotlin or Kafka or Kubernetes. They are all very good tools. But believing that the two tools will save you just alone is not really what, what I believe in. That's what I believe in. If you have a business problem to solve and you don't know what, you don't fully understand what you want, what you want to solve, Adding technology complexity and focusing on technology complexity is very pleasant for me as a developer, but it's going to make you have to solve two problems at the same time, which is more difficult and leads to complexity. So what makes a service modern? It's not the right question to ask. The question is, what's, what is wrong with legacy and what is the thing about legacy that we dislike, that we want to get away from it? Why green fields look so good. And here I can introduce a definition from the Wikipedia. Wikipedia, in the section about biology, has a process called calcification. Calcification, in my oversimplified biology understanding, is a process in which calcium accumulates in tissue, and the tissue is no longer flexible. So if I accumulate a lot of calcium in every muscle and every tendon, I will not be able to move. Same happens with software. And that means calcification, when it happens to your software, is when you get to that point in which doing any sort of, even a small change takes weeks and weeks and it's painful because you have to change everything everywhere because it's so bloody difficult. And this is what we want to avoid. Now, 
With that context, let's have a look at what happened in software development in the past few years. Well, maybe a bit more. We'll use this magic vehicle, accelerate to a very specific amount of uh, velocity, and then if we overdo it, we will get to the Big Bang, or maybe not, because opinions differ. If we accelerate a bit forward, we will get to EJBs. Who here has worked with EJBs? Good. The rest of you uh, haven't raised their hands or you're happy. Uh, the oversimplified, uh, as, I was uh, as I was told, uh, definition from Wikipedia says that it's all IBM's uh, legacy. Uh, apparently, the situation is a bit more complex. I haven't worked with EJBs 1.0 when they materialized. I don't know. I am not going to do archaeology about EJBs, but 1997 is when EJBs happen. Then, in 1999, several specifications happen and web applications enter the Java platform. So we can now do servlets and do web apps and have websites hosted on Java. Of course, they will have to have an application server and all the glory, but it's, but it's now possible. And then here comes 2001. Obviously, I cannot do that, Dave. But also we get EJBs 2.0. Why do we get EJBs 2.0? Because there is a problem with EJB 1.0. The problem was that all the calls within EJBs 1.0 were remote, using something called RMI. If you know what I mean, you know what I mean. If you don't, uh, there is not really a huge benefit in researching it right now. Uh, the bottom line is why EJB 2.0? Because they could be faster, because they would do local calls rather than going remote in the same machine, which is kind of inefficient. And they were also terrible because they used something uh, called xdoclet. If you have no idea what I uh, mentioned here, good, keep it that way. You will be happier. You are happier. If you know xdoclet, sorry to bring up the painful memories. What was the reaction to those two things? The reaction happened in the year 2003, again, according to a website. And you don't know if this history is accurate, but we got Spring's version 0.9. Spring version 0.9, the bottom line, why? Because EJB was too complex. And then we get to the year 2005, we get AJAX, which obviously stands for asynchronous JavaScript and JSON because nobody right now sends XML over to AJAX anymore. Year 2006 brings us EJB 3.0. And EJB 3.0 was kind of revolutionary. Why? Because it acknowledges that previous versions of EJBs were too complex. You already start to get the drift of where, where I'm getting with it. Year, to, uh, year 2014, Spring Boot 1.0. Why do we get Spring Boot 1.0? Because Spring was considered already too complex. Hmm, wasn't Spring the, the one that's supposed to be easy and simple and nice that takes the complexity of EGBs away? But hey, what can we say? And then we get this awesome quote. Sorry because it's in Polish, but I have a TLDR in my uh, attempt at an English translation. Somebody in year uh, 2020, said, Java E had a small, well thought API, 10 times smaller than Spring. Uh, I am not going to s tell you whether they, that person was right or wrong. I'm just going to show you that opinions happen like these in the internet. And then we get MicroProfile. In short, and maybe slightly incorrectly also, because Spring was considered too complex. And then we can come back to this big question that I started with a few minutes ago. What makes a service modern? How can we keep this feeling of service being modern. The answer that we see over the years in the history is simplicity. We like to have simplicity because simplicity means making changes is possible and remains being possible, which means we can actually do with the software what we want to do rather than the software does to us what it wants to. And that shouldn't happen because AI shouldn't conquer the world just yet. Simplicity. Let's have a look at simplicity of the stack. How can you do Hello World in Java, or Hello Web World, or there used to be a joke that the Hello World in Java is 23 lines. Luckily, those are not the days anymore, because if you try to do a Hello Web World in Java using Spark or Helidon or Javelin, I just randomly picked those uh, frameworks. There probably are more, and maybe there is a way to write it faster and quicker. Uh, you get a handful of lines, and it's almost self-explanatory. If you know Java or any related languages, it is self-explanatory. It's simple. It has become simple, finally. No web containers, no web descriptors, and so on and so on. And I sometimes mention Revolut. In Revolut, we actually use the first thing uh, on the top, which is called Spark. But we are going to migrate out of Spark towards something else very soon, or 
soon-ish, within the next year most likely. And you could ask me why, and the answer comes in here. Because if you look at GitHub's activity uh, pulses, you'll see that Helidon has a lot of activity, you'll see that Spark has less activity in the past uh, four or five years, and then you'll see again that Java Linus keeps being active. So, as I said, at Revolut, we use Spark Java. Recently, in my personal projects, I started playing with Helidon, just because, uh, because I was curious. I haven't tried Quarkus, so this is not me saying that any one of them is better. I just tried Helidon, and it worked, so I like it. It is being simple. And then, okay, simplicity is the thing that we want to establish in our services. The question then should be, how do we actually do it? I could say prevent calcification. But prevent calcification still doesn't answer the question, how does complexity get in there? How do services get through calcification? And how can we prevent it? So, one by one. How do you get a service to become this mighty, complex overlord, leading very straight to a big ball of uh, unknown substance? The answer is one commit at a time. Have you ever heard anybody doing a project with the assumption of let's build the most legacy project that we can. I know that some of you must work for the government, even you are laughing. I've heard some people approaching their projects with, ah, let's do whatever, I don't care. That happens very often. I've also heard one co con the, the conference competition in which somebody actually tried to build legacy and it was very difficult because it's hard to build stuff that just grows over and over, over years. So, frameworks. Which frameworks would I therefore advocate? Which frameworks should you use? The answer is uh, use whatever you want. The, fra the answer to the framework litmus test that we apply in Revolut and the answer to the framework question in general that I like applying is, again, the 2 a.m. in the morning test. Is the framework being magical? Because there are two kinds of engineers, and this is not the binary version. Here, there is the kinds of engineers who have fixed support projects under pressure, no distress, no the adrenaline rushes, and so on and so on. And there are those who will. My conclusion out of having fixed a few, and my heart rate goes up to 180 plus in such situations sometimes, is that I like my code being visible. I like when the code that is running is visible. I like the code to be tested because that gives me ease of reasoning about what's happening, and that means that I don't have to deal with those. In Revolut, we also prefer to avoid magic frameworks. Some example of magic frameworks, well, I can say Drop Wizard, Finagle, this and that. This list is not complete. There is more and more of them because uh, developers, engineers, well, you have realized very often and very rightly so that unnecessary complexity is not what we want. Well, some people want to go very radical, almost like anti-vampire, and say apage unnecessary complexity. And that's a very good approach. So what does a typical Revolut or a random Revolut serv service look like? This is how it starts, and this is how it does database migrations. I think this code looks reasonably simple. And people in the back rows, I hope you have eagle eyes. In the worst case, I'll be happy to share the slides so you can make your own opinions based on this. Uh, this is explicit. If this is explicit, then this means two things. If you want to debug it, you know where to put the debugger breakpoint uh, into which line. And if you want to think about what happens in what order, you don't have any magic bean binding happening behind the scenes because it's explicit, which means something goes strange, you debug, you reorder, you fix, and it's done. And then if you want to add another element of a startup or an application, you know where it belongs. And that brings us to quality. Quality as in, how do we ensure quality? How do you ensure quality in software? Obviously, you write tests. And how often and how many? The answer to that question lies in the time that your application uh, should live for. So basically, if you're building an application that should live for the next two weeks, and then it dies, and you're absolutely certain you're going to nuke it out of the planet, Good. You will have a different perspective than when you are writing software that, for example, is going to support a financial institution that's now used by over 20 million individual customers, 
a tiny plug towards where I work. And that perspective has been noticed by many smart people, like Martin Fowler, whom I have stolen a few screenshots uh, from the blog of. So let's consider this diagram. It shows the quality versus delivery speed. Uh, the crossing is the plane, the place in, uh, well, it's, it's, it's hard to pinpoint exactly when it happens, but it's, Martin claims that it occurs rather in weeks more, more than months, when it's easier to uh, introduce changes if you have uh, good quality. The problem that some of uh, us have gotten ourselves into is if you start with a new piece of technology and you get, well, you avoid writing tests or you don't write enough or you just kind of cheat a, a bit, is the initial productivity bump gets you quickly to results. And that's awesome, that's productive, that also gives you adrenaline and other hormones into your bloodstream. And that's very pleasant usually. But what we look at, especially at organizations like Revolut or any company that wants to stay in business for the next couple of years, is in the long run, the complexity takes over. Which means we want to define the time for which we uh, are building software for. And knowing the assumption that we're building for a long time, we will make tests and we will make the infrastructure and everything else with uh, appropriate assumptions. So in other words, we optimize for longevity, which means we know that we need to have tests and we need to have unit and functional, and we optimize for longevity. Why? Because it is quite inefficient to build software that immediately needs a rewrite. If you are talking about software that wants to live for a long time, if you're doing experiments, if you're just doing proof of concepts and it has a very short time span of, it's going to live very shortly, it is absolutely essential. This is a def definition. You're building software that is going to live for a very quick while, but if you're doing something long term, treat it like building it for the long term. What are the techniques that we use? Oh, very good question. For example, we have decided that we only want to use constructor-based injection. Somebody could say, this is radical. Uh, yes, maybe. Uh, why constructor-based injection? Because it's visible, because it's in the code. It also makes it very explicit that you're going to see more and more arguments entering constructors. And adding a constructor parameter with IntelliJ or any other modern ID is very simple. It's an old enter or whatever key map you're using and it's going to go in very quickly. Also, we like using immutability. Immutability like case, data, value classes, records, you know, you know those things. So what does a bean or a, an entity look like or a value class or a record in Revolut? This is a, an actual piece of code from one of, uh, one of our applications. You can see that everything is public and final. You can see the IDs are specific ID types. And you can see a bunch of checks. Public final, uh, because we want immutability. And we also have this guy. This guy, which upholds the invariance, is all over the place. You can see the check required, check required, check required, check required. It's basically verifying whether the argument that you're passing to the constructor is not null. And yes, we could do objects not null, but it doesn't allow for a comment, which means that was just a syntactic, well, that's just an internal library that allows us to t say what parameter was, was null. Why do we do it and where do we do it? We do it because we like this tiny amount of stability and certainty that this introduces. If you have an object constructed like this, you can be absolutely certain that it doesn't have nulls. That means if you uphold those invalidants absolutely everywhere in every single layer of your software, then you're going to end up with a lot of those. Yes, absolutely. And somebody could say, is that not really redundant because you've already verified it's our software. We know that this is not coming in as a null. Yes, you're right, but as the system grows, as there is more and more lines of software that you have to deal with and maintain, this is tiny amounts of stability that do produce compound interest because you can rely on the fact that this has not gotten into a state which I didn't want to, it to get to. You can rely on this being not null, you can rely on something being within a specific range, you can rely on something being as you expected. And you can write a test for it, and you can have integration tests invoke it, and it's always in there, and it's always verified, which means it's always enforced. And obviously, 
those classes, if you're coming to Java 17 soon, will become much shorter because of Java magic, which actually look the same. And then somebody here could say, why not use Lombok? So I have a question to the audience. Who here uses Lombok? Who here considers themselves an expert in Lombok? Have a look around. I don't see any hands. Uh, any Lombok experts? I'm not going to j joke about you. It's just a genuine question. So the question is, can this lead to a bug? You can ra raise your hands or you can shout the answer. Uh, you can win a party invitation if, if you win. OK, uh, we'll get to the answer. Data is supposed to be an immutable uh, data class, so something like a record. So probably a good key for a hash map. And then you notice this thing called uh, setter, which means Lombok will generate a setter for this. And if you put a key into a hash map, which is not immutable, and you mutate it after you've used it as a key into a hash map, how do you get to that object? Uh, you know that it's going to be, well, very hard if you want to get it by key, unless you use an iterator. And my point is not that there is anything wrong with Lombok. It's not Lombok's fault. This kind of setup, this kind of construct, in which it, it is possible to generate a bug, but only you, you will know about the bug if you know what happens inside and how it could lead to a bug is what we want to avoid very actively. So uh, we like, as I said, explicit software. So this is why we don't use Lombok. So what about mutability? Where do we store mutability? Where do we, how do we deal with it? Option number one, keep mutable stuff in the data store only. If, you, if your application follows that model, obviously this is a, this is a very good tried uh, thing. Software reasoning about immutable data structures, uh, in our perspective, works very well. Also, uh, somebody could say that it generates a lot of garbage. Uh, in our use case, it's perfectly acceptable. G1 deals with, with very nicely. Another great option is if you want uh, more power, is to use CQRS in event store. This is not a silver bullet but it's going to give you an explicit state transitions from of one entity from state one to state n. Uh, for a financial institution that wants to have software that has a long life time span for, for, for all the applications, this gives us a lot of power and we try to use this pattern in many places. We don't use it everywhere because uh, it comes at a price and it's not free and this is a conscious decision that we want to take. So we are mixing option one with option two. So having a current state and having event source and having events uh, as well. But this is a good option. Uh, also, I said that we use Postgres. Why Postgres? Why would a company that was started seven years ago start with Postgres? Why not use any other fancy, uh, modern, radical uh, data stores? Two reasons. Very good, very good understanding of the consistency model. You probably have learned or been taught how a, rel a relational database handles transactions when you were studying uh, about how software works. It's probably part of the engineering curriculums in most of the schools that teach engineering. If you have learned uh, this at school, awesome. If you would know, if not, books are available. This technology has been with us with, for many, many years. And second very important reason for the context of a startup that ex enjoys gro constant growth in number of users and organizations that use the software that we do is it has a predictable performance model. If there is a relational database, you can always do explain analyze in case of Postgres, which will tell you what indexes, what columns, why did a query take this long to execute. And that's extremely powerful because this means that we can we have data in front of our eyes. We can execute the troublesome queries. We, we know how to deal with it. We know how to optimize it. And then also two things, Liquibase or Flyway for managing migrations. This is what we do uh, if you use uh, something else for managing migrations, but you manage migrations in a, with a process, awesome. If you don't, I can only recommend those two. And we do test data stores with uh, test containers. We love them, and there is a small note that Docker has changed its license. Some people are still being surprised about it. So maybe if you are, then something is to look at. And we also use Juke. Juke, so no hibernate. And the question is, why? The answer to the question of why is because it allows us to use a DSL that generates always correct 
SQL, which looks like the query that you're generating, which means uh, uh, this is explicit. We know what's going to be run end to against the database, and we can very easily get the text of the query that's going to be executed against the database to the point in which we, if we are dealing with a very specific change in the query, because we want to optimize, optimize an edge case around Postgres, we can actually capture the SQL in a test and make sure that it always runs as expected. And somebody could say, why don't you use Hibernate? Why don't you use JPA? It's a standard. Well, my answer to that is, yes, absolutely, it is a standard. A standard means a lot of people have agreed that this is the way to do something. JPA and Hibernate are very good standards. They are very good tools. They give you a lot of power. They give you about a lot of productivity. Our perspective is Hibernate and JPA just didn't fit our view and our use case. There is nothing wrong with the tools. It's just we decided to do something else. And then we have this fact that legacy will happen. We know that software is read more than written and frustrates us more and more. So it's not only about technology. It's also about the business complexity. So how do we get uh, a hold of that? How do we hold it by the horns, so to speak? Uh, domains and who owns what matters. How do you enforce it? How do you enable people to hold the respons hold responsibility? The first layers is maintainers. If you work with a piece of software, you can reason about what a change to the piece of software that you often maintain and deal with is going to have, because then, if it breaks, you are the one that will have to fix it uh, in the middle of the night, for example. The approach that we follow is you build it, you run it. So in Revolut, anybody can make a modification to any application as and you can submit a PR. Whether that's accepted, it's up to the maintainers and owners of a particular application. If you need to modify the application, uh, go ahead. If you need to modify the infrastructure, just as well. It's infrastructure as code. Make the patch, submit the PR, and let's do it. The people who are going to have to accept it are the maintainers, so the people who are on a daily basis responsible for the application, because only them, only they have the long-term perspective and the feedback loop to think about what are the consequences to what they work with uh, and on on a daily basis, and how is that going to affect it. And on top of that, we have also something called uh, the watchman process, or people of the watch. And I promised pictures. So what is that? Is that people going through support? Is that people staying up all night watching and coming through logs? No. People of the watch is a process in which engineers go through anomalies and triage the problems and triage uh, anomalies in the logs, anomal anomalies in metrics, and report bugs. Why do we do it this way? Because if you're, depending on where you are in your uh, developer journey, if you're a seasoned developer, you know what matters, you know what doesn't, you know how to write a decent bug report so that whoever picks up the bug after has to deal with it and they will know what to do. If you're an engineer earlier in your journey, uh, when you get a bad bug report, it's going to be hard. But then if you have to write one, you're going to connect the dots. Or if it happens the other way, it also connects the do dots. But it also helps people who work with those applications build and maintain this feedback loop about what are the consequences of specific changes entering, which commit did a specific uh, back enter, or wh which commit triggered a specific exception to happen in production. Why does it happen? Which application it belongs to? Is it really this case, uh, this application? And it also encourages developers to take ownership and actually prioritize and triage a problem. Triage means decide whether this is critical or whether this is, yeah, this generates one exception per month, not a big deal. Or maybe it generates one exception per, per month, but it's a big deal because it's a, a big job that actually affects, I don't know, thousands of customers. It's the engineers who will have to make the tickets, and it's the engineers who have to look at anomalies and figure stuff out. They don't have to fix it. Don't, don't get me like that. They only have to describe what is the anomaly and what is the severity of the anomaly. So whoever has to work with it can make a decision about how often, how, how quickly does it need to be solved. OK, but that's that. But what about architecture? And about architecture, I'm going to use this awesome uh, picture that somebody uh, posted on Twitter. Is this architecture? Yes, no, opinions? Somebody says yes, somebody says, uh, well, waves their hands with not so much. Uh, the 
perspective of architecture that I like to use and the perspective on architecture that I find useful is architecture being a shared understanding. So if I understand what's happening, I understand the consequences, I can reason about multiple things, then this actually forms an architecture, which means a diagram that shows a number of boxes, maybe specific services, is not going to be architecture because it's going to become an inventory list which answers a very useful question of which services do we have? It's a valid question, but it doesn't answer the how does it work and it doesn't give you an architecture overview. You can also put them in domains, and that's better because that gives you more understanding, but this becomes a service map. This answers a question, where should a feature or a service be built in? Where should it belong? Who does it belong to? Which team should take an ownership of it? So architecture is a shared understanding, and I, I normally, as humans, we understand the consequences that affect us. This is how our brains are wired. It's, it's, that's what the scientists and people who research how people deal with reality uh, have found. So how do we do that? How do we do what we do in our software, in, in our pieces of software? What are, what are the processes there? Because you might have noticed that I've never used the word architect so far because we don't have architects. So engineers will go through a process called technology design review. Technology design review is a process that's a kind of a mixture of a design review plus an architecture decision log. If you have heard of architecture and decision records, awesome. If you're doing them, awesomer. If you don't, Google it after the talk. This is a practice that you can start doing in your workplaces maybe on Wednesday, because tomorrow you're still here, hopefully. Uh, what is that? Uh, it's a document that describes imp uh, intended changes within a service. What is the scope? What, is the, what are the results? Uh, what is the impact to security? What is the impact to performance? And so on, and so on, and so on. Uh, who makes these? Are there special uh, people who will make those talks, uh, or do those documents? Absolutely not. Every engineer within a team is empowered and able and allowed to do those. Uh, why do we do it like that? Very simple reason. If you have skin in the game, you are going to have different mental process about changes that affect you. So this is why we ask engineers to describe the processes and changes to the applications they work with. And then the question is, what? how do we do it? I'm going to give you a very uh, short recommendation. If you, know, if you already have a process, follow it, do it, keep doing that. If you don't, Use the C4 model as a starting point. Don't try to discover your own diagramming and, and, and uh, description uh, methodology. It's not worth it. It's already been done very well with the C4 model. We use it, we like it, and we find it very good, and I keep recommending that. And also use a text-based uh, diagramming tool, which means between the lines, you do not need enterprise architect in order to draw software diagrams. I know that's very shocking to some. Why plant UML or something similar? Because if you have text like this that converts into something like that on the right, text goes into Git, which we all know and love, and pictures can be generated in your builds. And that means that you can have a very cheap process or easy on the human uh, side of things uh, process that will automatically regenerate documentation whenever it's adjusted. And then we also follow a process called internal open source. What I mean by that is every engineer have, has read access and write access to uh, every application that we have within Revolut, or almost every, 99.9%. .9%. Which means if I want to check what application, for example, Grzegorz was working on, or what are the last comments that he, he did, I can do that, and he can do the same to me. And why is that? Because if I need to see what is the dependency between the services that I have, what is how to reason about it, I can always check, check it in the code. And because the code does no magic, which you already know from before, if I can infer it from the code, done. I've self-serviced my problem. If I have to ask somebody, I can check using uh, annotate or git blame, who was the last person that, that touched uh, those elements in the code. Which means everybody can make pull requests, but only service owners people responsible, people who will have to later maintain them, uh, will be the ones accepting it, which means 
people, software engineers, are the quality gates. They are the guardians. They are the ones that allow certain things in, or they don't. And then we talk about interactions in the context of architecture. So we could do this. Is this architecture? Uh, maybe. It certainly is a part of it. And if you check the C4 model, you'll see uh, where it belongs. But what I would encourage you to do is define the uh, interaction patterns that within your organization services are going to have. Within Revolut, very ori originally, we have discovered that we have RPCs, we have patches, we have even base com communications, I think. You might say yes as, as well, because this is, those are the communication patterns that you're going to most likely have in most of the software. Sorry. Uh, but we go one step further. We do something called clients. Uh, clients are libraries that if you want to use a service called Banana, you're going to take Banana client, which is going to hide all of the interactions between the whatever API the authors of Banana have, so that you don't have to redo the JSON integration or REST integration or gRPC integration. It, it all becomes implementation details. We try to push it away from, from the problem being solved because this is not the problem that you want to solve us and it's, it's problem already solved. And also, uh, who maintains those clients? The people who make the service. So if you're making if you're the owner um, of Banana, you're going to make a Banana client, and then you will test it to verify and to prove it to people that it works very well. And what about languages? Uh, short reminder, in Revolut, we primarily rely on Java, which means if, if there is a client that is in Java, it's going to be good for most of the services, except for those, of, uh, those in Python. And then for the Python services, sometimes they will have a Python client. Uh, and that means that if I want to integrate with any other service, maybe let's add orange to the banana, I just take in the orange client into the dependency list of my applications, and then it's done. If I need an interaction uh, that orange client doesn't provide, I can make a pull request, and you already know what's the story of that because I told you about the internal open source. And we also have an internal event distribution layer which you can read about and talk about later. But what about monitoring? What about Kubernetes? What about continuous delivery? I didn't mention that. But I said my presentation is about modern Java microservice in the cloud. Is there something wrong? Well, no. That was the mind trick that I did on you. There is a paper by Nicholas Carr, and he's not the only one that noticed this trend. It, the paper is called It Doesn't Matter, or IT Doesn't Matter. Uh, what it says is that monitoring is a commodity. Use something that works and don't invest into the problem unless you are working in a company that actually has to investigate monitoring very, very much. If you want to do software in the cloud, use Kubernetes, use whatever else works for you. Keep doing that because this is not going to make a difference, or my opinion is that it's not going to make a difference between you and your competitors, whether you're using VMs, Docker, Kubernetes, or something else. The devil is elsewhere. Continuous delivery, well, the year is 2022. Obviously, we do it, obviously do it. Uh, that's another piece of commodity which we all know and which we all want to solve once and apply, uh, apply across all the applications. Software wants to solve business problems. So how to capture business reality? How do we do it? Or how do we not do it enough, if I have to be honest? Uh, this, this practice of event storming, I'm not even going to try to describe it because I would run out of time, yes, and this is good enough for a whole session or whole trainings or months of exploration. But the bottom line is software between the lines, behind the technicalities, is usually a people problem. It's, it's human communication that is difficult. Protein-based, human-based, does not scale. As in, it takes 20 plus years to get a developer up to speed from scratch. And you have to be very lucky so that nothing bad happens and they actually choose this career because they might decide to be a pursuant of a different career, not going to point any fingers. Uh, so we're getting close to end of time and I'm going to try to see how much I can stretch it. There is a, a lot of complexity in the business. We, and I encourage you to and optimize for the long term. Look at what 
in the perspective of a few years, you would like to have had and build it, start building it immediately. Build quality and resilience in. This is going to pay off and is going to pay you off big. And keep doing that one step at a time because this is how you fight off the legacy and calcification. And simple to understand, simple to scale actually works and scales. Now, that wouldn't be a complete talk without book recommendations, so I'm going to click a few times. Uh, this is a good moment to take a picture of, or you can ask me for uh, the slides, or something better. I can tell you, enjoy the conference, but before you start doing anything, there is Java plus Geopardy today at 19 o'clock in the exhibition hall. And a special question to you. Who remembers this thing? Who remembers this event? That was J Barcelona 2015. Uh, I'm super impressed uh, with how awesome this event has grown. And with that, I can start saying thank you. And we can get to the Q&A part. If somebody missed this five seconds for you. Now, questions, raise your hands or approach the mics and I will check the application in the meantime. Do we have any questions? What do you mean about making code visible? Do you mean to be easy to read? Yes, uh, yes exactly, this is, uh, this is part of it. Uh, code visible means there is no, we at Revolut like not to have too many annotation processors in between the lines. Because code, ex code that is easy to read and code that is expli well, explicit and visible is the code that you can read line by line. And if it, you well, delete the line, obviously the code doesn't execute, which means that you comment it out, it doesn't happen. If you put a breakpoint in there, you're going to be able to inspect it. And this is how we go on step by step, step by step. Uh, we like that approach because in the long run, year over year, people with scars after having had those late night uh, fixing calls and stressful uh, something doesn't work in production situations uh, seem to all converge on the opinion that too much magic that not everybody can understand is is actually dangerous because it, explo it can explode in unexpected ways and the reality and putting software out there that uh, will work with people trying to actively do something unwanted to it is going to surprise you anyway which means uh, we like sim simple visible and, and explicit not too many annotations in our case everything written down but you probably are interested okay isn't that uh, too verbose actually not because you can wrap a, lo a lot of that into libraries and or uh, things that uh, hide it where can we get the presentation file uh, sorry this is the one uh, this is how you can get the presentation file. What would be your opinion if I said I'd like to refactor your params class into two classes, params and params with top-up limits since, uh, let's take it after, I'm not going to switch back the slides. Do you have heavy logic in your juke statements or do you try to limit it? Uh, yes, we try to have juke statements uh, do one thing only. As in we try not to have uh, stored procedures, we try not to have too much logic in the database. We do have some triggers in the database, we do have some procedures, but it's minimum. As in, of all those 300 services, some, some, will, use, uh, some will use those features, because for example, if you're using Partman, so uh, the toolkit for managing partitions in Postgres, there is some enhancing of the indexing on partitions that we want to enforce so that it's later easy to deal with, with those partitions. But uh, one statement, one, well, we try to keep it simple. We like keep it, keeping it simple because that's, that scales and that's, uh, that wants it. Which means also, uh, in the long run, if something becomes too big, we will refactor. Uh, obviously, this is organically felt and we organically decide that this actually area has, has become a bit too big. We don't have any metrics that drive those decisions, but we're trying to build uh, those as we speak. What is your decision process with adding, when adding new functionality? Add it to an existing service versus create a new one. Well, it, it's easy, it depends. Uh, no, the real answer is uh, this is why we, uh, this is one of the reasons why we have the design uh, review process. Because one of the danger that very frequently happens in an organization that has crossed a certain size, and we're talking a couple hundred engineers at least with, in, in the context of Revolut, is 
uh, the problem is called software discovery, or I call it software discovery. How do you know that the team has not built somewhere a feature that does exactly what I need to build right now? If I don't know about it, I'll, I'm, I'm going to end up building it, and then we're going to have 17 different ways of doing that. And that's not scaling, and that's troublesome, and that's going to lead to bugs, and that's not what we want. Which means we want to expose the big feature changes or the intended uh, application enhancements so that people can question uh, where does a change belong. And any engineer can join this software design review and ask, hey, but this is, do you, don't you think that this actually makes this application too big? And sometimes the answer becomes yes, and sometimes we decide to split this application or maybe sunset it completely and uh, create two other new applications that will have a very well-defined area of responsibility because as organically you add features to an application, sometimes from a well-defined form, they become this, let's call it a misshapen potato. Uh, the only good reaction to that is to cut it. But you have to, this doesn't happen at once. It happens over time. And then when you realize you are dealing actually with this misshapen potato, you are going to cut it and put things uh, back in order. It happens to us as well. Do we have any other questions in the magic application? Oh yeah, we have quite a lot. How many, uh, how much time do I, can I still take? We have until six o'clock, so we have four more minutes. Any questions directly in, in person? I don't see anything, okay, happy with that. Um, how do you version your services? Uh, there are two ways. Uh, internal services, so services that are not exposed to anybody outside of the company, have only one version, which is the current version. Uh, this could be surprising, but we also believe in continuous integration, and we also want people to always use the latest version, because if you don't, then the uh, opposite situation is you will have people on the older version. And if you have people on the older version, you now have two versions that you need to support. And then if you have two, then soon you will have three and four, and this is, become, this is a straight way to hell. Uh, so because we control our environment, because it's our environment, uh, we can enforce, and we do, do actually do it, we only uh, always release the latest version from master that passed all the builds. So we always, whenever you run your application, it's going to use the latest versions of all the dependencies that it has the internal ones. The external ones, they are going to follow named versions. The public APIs obviously have to have a, a bit more stability, and they do have a stability and a life cycle, and we publish this, for example, on our, on our GitHub. Uh, what's a typical team structure in Revolut? Do you have team leads, QAs, product owners? Uh, yes, no, yes. Uh, team leads, absolutely. Product owners, absolutely. We don't have QAs. We have zero QAs. We have uh, software engineers who will, do who will automate the test cases that need to be automated. And this is the only approach to quality that we found scalable. What I mean by scalable is that you do not waste time waiting for some, somebody to do something, which also means that the tests are going to execute every single time you run them exactly the same way, which also means that you have to refactor your tests sometimes, or some of the test cases will become completely obsolete and they should exist no more, and then you delete them. But uh, if you are talking 10 services, human testing maybe works. If you're talking 50 services, you can say, hey, we need more testers. If you're talking a couple hundred services, uh, how can you, within a very good time limit, enforce that all the test cases have, have been executed? Uh, we, only have found, we only have found automation, and this is not a surprise to be the only answer to this. In Revolut, it's quite normal for a line that you merge into master to end up in production within the hour. And we are quite certain that it's not going to have adverse effects because of the hundreds of thousands of test cases that we have that enforce and bring stability to the applications. But getting to those hundreds of thousands took years, and it happens one commit at a time or one pull request at a time. There is no pull request that, that sees no test. This is just an instant, no other, other, other peer review. But uh, over time, it's, it works. Then the typical team structure, let's cover the rest of uh, that outside. The people on the watch you mentioned, is that dedicated people or rot rotate? If, is it done by dev squads or as part of the sprint? Uh, yes, it rotates. So it's not one person who is always uh, on, on the watch. There are people who people rotate through the role uh, because we don't want all of the pain 
and all of the learning and all of the consequence building to go to only one person. So it goes to every engineer within a team, and we have an application that supports that. It's, it's a simple rota. And it happens only during working hours for most of the teams, which is probably quite unusual, but this is how we do it. And I'm afraid this is really the time in which I have to say thank you. It was an absolute pleasure to be here with you.